Today's scripture reading is from Daniel, chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Thanks for standing in for your husband, Mary. <laughs> have you ever wondered if God was truly in control and he truly cared about the details of your life? Perhaps when bad news came concerning your job or a family member's health or something to do with your children, you questioned if God was really there. Life takes you on a roller coaster ride sometimes of many ups and downs where you sometimes can sense the presence and work of God in your life. And sometimes you wonder if he's forgotten you or if he really cares. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, along with Daniel, had been on such a roller coaster ride. They had survived being exiled from their homeland and taken prisoner in Babylon. In chapter 1 of Daniel, we we'll read about how the four of them had stood their ground and they refused to eat food that was forbidden by their faith and their culture. And they actually came out ahead for that. And they were given positions of honor and considered to be equal to or even better than, than all the wise men and the magicians of Babylon. But then in chapter 2, when the king had a dream that uh, his magicians could not interpret, he was so angry that he wanted to put all the wise men to death, including Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Chapter 2, verse 12 says, This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men in Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death, and men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. But then, as you might know the story, Daniel stepped up and he was able to interpret the king's dream. And the tables turned once again for these four men. Chapter 248 says, Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. And that brings us then to chapter 3, and we see that these men were once again facing death, now for the third time. Now, for some reason, Daniel himself is not involved in this event. We can only presume that at the time he was off somewhere else doing the king's business, since he had such a high position, and he wasn't even in the vicinity while all these events were taking place. Otherwise, we can assume that he would have been involved right in the middle of those things. But chapter 3, verse 1, begins with a description of a 90 feet high, 9 feet wide statue of gold. And it was put up by King Nebuchadnezzar. And as we see in verses 5 and 6, that, that everyone was commanded, well, when the music played, that they were commanded to bow down and to worship this golden image. And anyone who didn't do that then would be punished by being thrown into a, a blazing furnace. And verse 7 says then that, all the peoples, all the nations, all the men of every language fell down and worshipped this image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And after all, nobody wanted to be thrown into a fiery furnace, and so everybody obeyed the king and worshipped this gigantic statue. It's interesting that as we read through this entire chapter that the word worship appears 11 times in this chapter. I think this alone tells us something, that that is the real theme of this chapter the idea of worship is really what is at the, the crux of the matter. It's not a matter of if you will worship, but it's a matter of what you will worship. These Jewish exiles to a foreign land had to decide just what and who they were going to worship. And they decided that they were not going to do what all the peoples and all the nations and all the men of every language did. They were not going to worship anything or anybody except the one true God. And so, when the time came and the music played with all these different musical instruments and everybody else stopped what they were doing and, and they bowed down to the image, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would not do it. Now, imagine, if you will, 
how these people felt who had been displaced by these Jewish exiles. The, the magicians, the enchanters, the astrologers, and, and others who were considered wise men had been passed over when Daniel and his friends were elevated to positions over them. Now, that would have been hard enough to be passed over by their own countrymen, but for these foreigners who had been conquered by the Babylonians to be elevated over them and, and given these high positions had to have filled them with jealousy and resentment. And so verse 8 tells us that they came forward and they denounced the Jews. One translation says that they maliciously accused the Jews. And verse 12, they said, there are some Jews who you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. And you can just sense their resentment and their, and their hatred of these Jews that their king had honored over them. And, uh, and so they, they kind of exaggerated the truth by saying, well, these men pay no attention to you. And then went on to say that, uh, and that, that they wouldn't worship that, that, that idol that you set up. Well, the first part really wasn't true, that they didn't pay any attention to the king. Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego did many things that integrated themselves into the culture of the Babylonians and, and demonstrated submission and, and service to the king. You see later in verse 21 that they had dressed in, in Babylonian clothes. They had turbans and trousers and, and robes and, and other clothes that, that Jews, Jewish people wouldn't wear. And that just kind of shows that, th that they worked within the customs and the practices of this foreign land. The only things that they wouldn't do was to disobey the commandments of, of their God, the one true God. I've often said, I'm sure you've heard me say, that living the Christian life is that of being counterculture. We have to go against the stream of how the rest of society live. But that does not mean going to the extreme that some groups do, groups that really will have nothing to do with secular society, and they do not integrate into the workplace of the world, or they use modern technology, or will they use modern transportation or modern communication. Now, I respect their stance, certainly, and that's very admirable. But there's nothing in the Bible to suggest that we need to do that. Most of us integrate into the culture in many different ways. But the time to be counterculture is when to integrate into the culture would mean to disobey the commandments of God. When God says one thing in his word and to our hearts and culture says something else, who are we going to listen to? Hopefully we have learned that it is always worth it to obey God rather than to just follow the culture. But we also learned that it may cost us something to do that. There is a cost to being counterculture. People don't like it when we do that. They may feel resentment, or they may feel like they're being judged. Personally, I think that it's possible to judge the culture without judging people, but it can be very hard to convey that. And so therefore, we can expect to be maliciously accused of things that aren't even true, just like these three men were. To obey God may cause us to be unpopular, or unaccepted and some Christians just can't deal with that and so they just integrate into the culture so that they can feel like they're a part of things and they're accepted hopefully you and I have the courage to to go against the culture in order to obey God when you think about that can we really do that even if it would threaten our personal livelihood even if it would threaten our personal physical safety that can be a different story and that may even come into play in the not too far away future. And we may be tested to see if we will not violate what God commands even when culture threatens violence or harm against us. The astrologers did accurately state that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not worship the idol. And so verse 13 tells us that they were brought before the king and he asked them about it. He said, is it true? Are you really refusing to do what I commanded you to do? He wanted to make sure. Maybe his intel was wrong. Or, or perhaps the king thought that they just misunderstood what, what he was asking. After all, he was not asking them to abandon their god. He just wanted to, them to, to add this idol to their gods. And so he's going to give them another chance. He says, okay, now when you hear the music, okay, it's very clear when it's time to do that. Then, and, and if you bow down and worship, then very good. All is forgiven. We'll just forget this little incident. But if you don't, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. And then the king asked the ultimate question. Then, what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Now, I don't know, maybe Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego huddled up before answering this question. Or perhaps they had already prepared their reply uh, after discussing some options among themselves. Or perhaps they had considered some other options of what they might be able to do. Thinking things like, 
well, you know, we are a long way from home. You know, maybe mom and dad will never find out. <laughs> maybe we should go ahead and bow down. You know, what happens in Babylon stays in Babylon, right? <laughs> or, or maybe it would just be easier to be servants in the king's forces than ashes in the king's furnace. And you can hardly blame them if they perhaps thought such things. But as Mary read for us this morning in verse 17, they wisely responded, the God we serve is able. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that we have set up. They had faith that God was totally capable of doing whatever it is that he wanted to do. Now, please hear this before we go any further. The strength of their faith was not what determined the outcome. The point of the story is not that, well, they believed in God so that they didn't have to die in the furnace. Spoiler alert in case you didn't know the end of the story. <laughs> this is how most people would interpret this story. If your faith is strong enough, then nothing bad will happen to you. And that just is not true. A sovereign God will do whatever he wills and whatever will bring him glory. In this case, God did spare them, and he allowed them to live because that is what would bring him the most glory. In another case, God could have allowed them to become martyrs because that is what would have brought him the most glory. And that's often been the case. There have been many Christian martyrs throughout the years. Well, they were willing to accept whatever God chose to do because they knew their God is able, and so they were not going to worship any other God. Well, at any rate, Nebuchadnezzar reacted with absolute fury. Now, as you read through Daniel, do you get the idea that Nebuchadnezzar maybe could have benefited from some anger management courses? In chapter 2, verse 12, he says, The king was so angry and furious, he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. Chapter 3, 13, as we read, he was furious with rage, and he summoned these men to come before him. And now in verses 19 and 20, it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. One translation says that his countenance changed. And we've all seen that happen to someone. You know, a person can get so angry that the entire expression of his or her face can, can change and, and look like an entirely different person. Have you ever made someone so mad that deep creases form between his eyes and, and red begins to creep over his face and perhaps a vein in the neck or the temple begins to throb with every beat of his heart? But here we see the error of losing one's temper. The most powerful man in the world could just not believe the defiance of those who, in his mind, he had treated so well. How dare they defy his orders? And so he ordered that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. Most scholars believe that this simply means as hot as possible, with seven being the complete number. And then he ordered for some of his best men, the strongest in the army, to take Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to tie them up and to throw them into the furnace. Now think about that for a minute. If he really wanted the punishment to be as severe as possible, he would have lowered the temperature of the furnace to a slow boil, and then the torture and the, and the, the death of, of these men would have been longer and slower and more excruciating. But he was so mad, he just said, I'll teach him. Get the furnace as hot as it can be. You think it was hot before? Just wait. No, then, then tie him up so they can't even squirm around. That'll show him who's boss. But what happened, as verse 22 tells us, that the extreme heat from the furnace killed his best soldiers that he picked out to take this and do this job. And when they just got close to the furnace, and as these three men then fell into this blazing furnace. Now, we talk a lot about righteous anger. We like to think that we have a right to get angry, and we're justified in doing so. After all, even Jesus became angry, and he acted on that anger. Well, that does prove that there is such a thing as righteous anger and that it is possible to be angry and to not sin. And we all want to be like Jesus, right? But the thing is, most of the time when we lose our temper, we don't act righteously. The things that we end up doing and saying only end up hurting ourselves, not punish the ones we're angry with, which is what we think we're doing. I'm going to show you how righteously angry I am so you'll learn your lesson. But what happens is that our temper just comes back to bite us. And often it ends up hurting the ones who are closest to us that we never even intended on hurting, just like those soldiers were burned up. And that can happen in so many ways, can it? Your loved ones can be negatively impacted by your display of temper. 
Yes, there are times when injustice and cruelty demand that we rise up with a righteous anger and we act with integrity and godly authority to combat against evil. But before we go comparing ourselves to Jesus and, and the righteous anger that he expressed, we might be much better off to consider the word of God written by James in chapter 1, verse 19, which says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because man's anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. I know I can attest, and perhaps you can too, that when I am quick to anger and, and therefore quick to speak and to act, that it just about never produces the righteousness that God desires me to produce. All right, so back to our three heroes here. We don't know what may have been going on while Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were being dragged to the blazing hot furnace by the king's strongest men. Perhaps they talked on the way to the furnace. Did they wonder, God, are you there? What's going on? Are you letting this happen? Did they say, well, plan one didn't work out so well. Do we have a backup plan? Or maybe they just said, guys, it's been good knowing you. I'll see you on the other side. Well, verse 23 tells us that they fell firmly tied into the blazing furnace, the furnace that had killed those strong soldiers when they'd just gotten close to it. Then we have one of those accounts that can only be explained by a supernatural intervention by Almighty God. Nebuchadnezzar looked into the furnace. He must have been far enough away from it not to be scorched himself. But verse 24 tells us what he saw. It says, then King Neb Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? And they replied, certainly, O king. Yes, your majesty. That just cracks me up when I think about that question that, that the advisors had to answer. You know, what do you suppose they thought when they heard this question? Now, now, how many men did we just tie up and throw to be incinerated to death? <laughs> well, let's see. There was Shadrach. That, that's one. Mm -hmm. And there was uh, Meshach. There, there's two. And then Abednego, three. Yes, you got it right, king. You're a sharp one. Yes, you are. There were three men we threw in there. You got it. And then verse 25, Nebuchadnezzar says, well, Look here, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound, unharmed. And the fourth one, there's something different about him. He looks like a son of the gods, like he's almost divine or something. Well, no one knows for sure what to make of this fourth person in the furnace. Perhaps it could have been an angel who from time to time in the Bible is known to appear in human form. But there was something unhuman-like about this particular person. Many scholars believe, and I have no problem or trouble believing this either, that this is what is called a Christophany, or an appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. You know, since we know that Jesus has always existed, he was in the beginning with God and has always been God, that even before he came to earth as a, as a little baby, even before the word became flesh and, and lived among us, that he still existed. And so this could be him. There would be no reason why he would not choose to reveal himself in other ways and at other times. Well, if this was, in fact, Jesus, I think it had to do with more than just filling Nebuchadnezzar with shock and amazement, which is pretty cool. But I think it's mostly for the benefit of our three heroes who understood now that they were being sent to their deaths unless God intervened. And when they had fallen into the furnace and found themselves no longer tied up, not being burned by the fire, and someone else in there with them they would realize that God had intervened and that he was able to save them and that they were not alone in their situation. God had known about this all along and he had protected every hair on their head and every thread of their clothes. He was able to do just as they said that they believed he was able. Nebuchadnezzar could not believe his eyes. And so as you see from verses 26 and 27, he must have turned the heat down some because he could then approach the furnace and again, it's kind of funny. He says, okay, you guys, come on out of there. <laughs> this isn't working. Let's check this out. And his royal host inspected the men to discover that there were no burns on their bodies. Their hair was not even singed. Their clothes were not burned. And not even the smell of smoke was present. Juanita and I were talking at the bowling alley about the days when uh, smoking indoors was permitted. And if you just went into a bowling alley, then you would come out reeking of smoke because of all the smokers in the building. Everybody would think that you'd just been smoking up a storm and all you did was be in the building. Well, these guys had just come out of a, a blazing furnace and they didn't even smell like smoke. God turned the, the 
mighty king's flaming furnace and just to a, a mere backdrop of his glory. Well, the story ends up with the king issuing a decree saying, don't anybody mess with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's God. There's no one like him. You know, don't say anything against him or you'll be in big trouble. And that was all fine and good. That was certainly an acknowledgement that Nebuchadnezzar respected their belief in their God. But I don't think that means that Nebuchadnezzar started worshiping God himself or that he gave up any of his false gods. There's no evidence of that, considering all that we've come to, to know about him. But he did acknowledge that the God of these Jews was real and someone to be reckoned with. And ultimately, these Hebrews earned another promotion, as we see in verse 30, that the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. I think it's very important that we don't get the wrong idea about this. A lot of people and a lot of prosperity preachers will present the main message of the story is that if you have enough faith, then all your problems get taken care of. You will get promoted in your job. You'll get rescued from your problems. You'll get healed from your sickness. And you'll come out ahead. And if you're not promoted or you're not rescued or you're not healed, that means that you just didn't have enough faith. No, this story could just as easily have turned out that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were killed in the fire. And that God was able to receive glory through that way that they demonstrated their faith. Sometimes that's how things end. Sometimes we get royally burned, if you'll pardon the pun. And, and God uses that as, as a testimony of our faith. The lesson of the story is that we are to remain firm in the fire, whatever that fire may be in our lives. And there are a lot of figurative furnaces that we get tied up and thrown into. We must know that whatever we have to go through, that Jesus is right there with us. We're never alone. He will never leave us or forsake us. And whatever happens to us, whether we get rescued or delivered or healed or, or whether we have to suffer unimaginably, God is in control. And we can trust that he will use us and whatever happens to us to bring glory to himself as long as we remain faithful. The central idea is that despite all appearances, despite the way it may look to someone looking in from the outside, God does control the affairs of mankind. He decides how things are going to turn out. And our job is simply to trust him. Therefore, first of all, we should be faithful to him no matter what. Even if it looks like things are not going to turn out well. Even if we stand to lose everything. Our money, our health, our reputation, our lives. And secondly, we should be fearless of man no matter what. Even if it seems that evil is prevailing and immoral people are coming out ahead. Even if it seems that we have no control over what other people do to us and we're put in a position of subordination that we don't deserve. Will you believe that God is able to do what is best and trust that whatever he chooses to do is best? Will you be able to trust him no matter what? I mean, maybe you will prevail. Maybe justice will be done and, and right will conquer and evil will be vanquished. God's in the business of doing that. He's been doing that ever since he created the world. Maybe you will be healed and you'll live to be 100 and be an example of the benefits of a righteous life. God does that too. Or maybe your life will be a difficult one. Maybe it'll be a mess, but your heart will be right with God because you're trusting that God is using your circumstances as a way to bring about justice, as a way to defeat evil as a way to show the benefits of a righteous life that, that, are, that are internal and that are eternal. Now God does that too. That's what he did when he sent his son. He sent him in the flesh to suffer and to die a horrible death so that righteousness will prevail and evil will be conquered. So either way, we just have to trust in our Savior who is able. We just have to trust him even in the fire. We have to trust him until that day that he comes again and he will make all things right.